Hey everybody, Josh, amateur radio call sign KI6NAZ. Do you have a radio communications plan for an emergency situation? Have you thought about what is the worst possible situation that could happen related to comms? I have. It is an EMP or an electromagnetic pulse. I've done a live stream on the topic, but I thought I would put together a kit that is inexpensive but covers many bases following a PACE plan that we talked about on another live stream. And this is it. This is my tactical trash can, and I'm going to talk about it today on the Hammer Radio Crash Course. Thanks for watching. Now, why would you want to have a trash can full of electronics? Well, it's to protect from an electromagnetic pulse or EMP. Put simply, an EMP is like a central transmitter, hypothetically, that transmits a short duration but massive amounts of power, and that power covers all the frequencies, all the frequencies, pretty much. And anything that gets picked up, anything that can pick up that power, power lines can hurt the power generation facility, the, the power plants, your phone, the antenna on your phone can pick up that power, fry your phone. Ham radio is designed to pick up frequencies. They get fried, they get shorted out, they're done. Uh, it basically will fry via this massive amount of power they're put out, anything that can receive that power. So the only way to protect from it is to hide your electronics in something that's basically a Faraday cage. Electrically sealed box type unit that frequencies could not get into. It basically created a null zone that anything inside of the Faraday cage could not be harmed by things like EMP or just relative interference. The problem with a Faraday cage is anything that's transmitting inside of it also can't get out unless there's a pass through. And if there's a pass through, that means things can get back in and then you're back to frying your electronics. Today, I'm gonna walk through what I've put in this kit and why there are some off-roads that you can take to change up your own kit if you're following along in this process, this build-up of an EMP kit at home. And please, if you like these kind of videos, give me a thumbs up, hit subscribe, hit that notification bell because I live stream every Saturday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Without further ado, let's check out this kit. All right, so the core of this whole thing centers around this Barron's aluminum, what is this? six gallon trash can. The reason why I went with the Barons is this lid here seals on really tight. It's got a really tight press fit. You gotta lean into it a bit. And then it's got this handle that is an extra kind of clamping force on top of the can. And that's what you want. Going back to the idea concept of a Faraday cage, you want an electrically connected box or vessel that you put your stuff inside. Underneath the lid of this is a seal that is designed specifically to remove any holes or open seams that could allow EMP radiation or energy to fly into this box and cause damage. Also, it increases the attenuation value of the actual kit. I'll post the links for all this stuff, and there's a lot to cover in the description, so please check that out. So an important thing to understand is it, this doesn't have to be specifically a man-made EMP or a naturally occurring EMP. The sun puts out EMPs, like a coronal mass ejection. Large enough amount you can actually cause damage to electronics with certain CMEs. But the thing that kind of everybody worries about or thinks about or preps about is an EMP related to a high altitude thermonuclear explosion. A nuclear bomb set off in high altitude creates an EMP wave, if you will, from the center explosion point. And that explosion acts just like I talked about in the beginning of the video. It is a super wide banded wave of destruction that if it hits your electronics or anything that can radiate power like an antenna or a power line, it will go back into where the electronics are and fry them. Again, that's why we need a little bit of security. Things to keep in mind while we're going through this kit, you can assume that if there is a bad enough EMP, and I'm treating it like pretty bad EMP time, why prepare for a light dose, right? You wanna prepare for the worst case. 
in preparing for an EMP, I assume that everything, like continental US everything, has some kind of massive damage. And where there would be pockets of network uh, communication like the internet, I'm assuming most of it's gone. I'm going so far to also assume that things we take for granted like GPS might also be gone. Why? Well, a lot of EMPs could potentially affect satellites. Sure, they're shielded, hopefully, from uh, radiation like that because they are outside of the atmosphere where the sun's radiation could harm them. But given a certain range, I'm guessing that a lot of satellites could be taken out by an EMP. So, so first thing, we're going to talk about the lid. The lid in this case is just the lid that the trash can comes with. Obviously, it has a modification on it. This is an MFJ antenna mount, um, specifically one that is for like a pole or some kind of a mirror if you're on like a semi truck. This is basically a CB mount if you notice the thread type. And you notice that's not a standard SO239. And there's a reason for that. I have an antenna, a couple of antennas that I'm packing for this specific reason that will work off of this while it's sitting on the can. Yeah. So this is just an extra bit of stability. The handle's really not strong enough. So I did a little pop rivet on the outer edge here and uh, that allows it to just hold it a little firmly. Top bag, one of my first antennas that we're gonna be walking through. And this is a pace plan that I will be talking about as we go. The first antenna is an Ed Fong J-Pole, much recommended by, by many people, well-loved. I like it too, it's a great hiking antenna. And then I've got two radials that I constructed out of 18 gauge wire, silicone coated wire, which is really nice for using as radials because you're gonna have to pull it in and out. And I 3D printed two wire winders for this. And this works pretty well. Next, 18 feet of RG8X. This is from uh, ABR Industries, which is generally the coax I use. This is what they sell at HRO, which generally means that's the coax I buy. One of the first items in our pace plan, this is our alternate item. I assume that primary comms is gonna be voice, whether it's gonna be FM using VHF, UHF radios, or HF using single sideband, but it's gonna be voice. So I'm gonna have a mic in my hand or a radio in my hand and talking that way. But an alternate mode of communication, one that I hope will be usable, it'll really depend on other people who survives, whose radio equipment can live through an EMP, is gonna be digital. So I will be bringing my, ras my portable Raspberry Pi solution, which is still the Raspberry Pi 4. This is the four gig model, not the new one that just came out. And I'm using that anodized aluminum case that I talked about in another video, actually multiple videos. And I'll post that link in the card so you can check it out if you're interested in your own Raspberry Pi solution. The advantage of the Raspberry Pi is that with this, I can do both HF digital and I can also do VHF UHF packet. So this adds redundancy to whatever solution it is I'm trying to run, which is extremely handy. Again, not only are we trying to um, hit all of our pace points, we're also trying to build in some redundancy so that we don't run into problems where we lose one and we have nothing. Now, first radio item I'm gonna show you, you have already seen this as well because I've reviewed it, is the C-Crane Skywave single sideband. And the reason I put this in is Maybe it's just me thinking the worst possible instances of what could happen in a situation like an EMP, but how do you know that there won't be more EMPs? How do you know that after the first one goes off, you wait, you know, six hours, pull all your radio equipment out, and then it happens again? Well, you don't. So what would I do? Well, I would put up a receiver, an inexpensive receiver, and start listening for information that I can get. If after a couple minutes of scanning, I don't hear anything, I'm going to put this back into my bucket and not potentially make my other radio equipment, my transmitting radio gear, vulnerable. So this is like my scout. This is my canary in the coal mine. I'm going to use this to scan around with its real antenna for single sideband. So I'll do the best I can with this to hear what I can, AM frequencies, SM broadcast frequencies, for whatever's going on with the disaster. So that's kind of the step one, is see what's out there. And I'll be scanning with my C-Crane Skywave single sideband. The handy talkie that I'll be carrying, although I have another one, the handy talkie that I'll be using probably the most is gonna be my Yaesu FT2DR. Why not the FT3DR, you say? Well, this has been sitting around not getting much love, so this is gonna go in the EMP kit. And yeah, I am actually keeping this all together. I'm gonna to check the batteries occasionally, keep them topped off, although I have the ability to recharge them. But this is gonna be living in this case along with 
its battery and a AA battery caddy or tray that goes into this as well. So I'll have the ability to charge this natively, but also have the ability to keep it topped off with AA batteries if I need to. So think about that. Again, when you're making an EMP kit, this stuff's supposed to live in the box until you need to use it. And ideally you might not be using it for that long, kind of a temporary deployment kind of thing, maybe a POTA can, maybe this is a POTA can. I don't know, post in the comments what you think. It's not just a tactical trash can, it's a POTA can. Key point, because I forgot to mention it. The reason why I went with the FT2DR uh, over any of my other HTs, like I have a ton, I could put one of them in there. This does APRS and I will have multiple ways of doing APRS, but this one, um, this one's always a really good unit for that. Coupled with the Edfong j pole, it'll work fine. For FRS, not GMRS in this case, I'm just bringing the FRS. Again, you don't really know what you're going to encounter. There's not a lot of space in here, so I wanted something small. This is the Redivis RT45. I've done a review on these too. I don't have a ton of FRS radios, but I do have these. And what makes these special, at least for why I'm packing them, is they're USB chargeable if you put rechargeables in here, but they're double A. And that's gonna make sense in a little bit, but that is the battery, the primary choice that I'll be carrying. The next antenna item, as you know I gotta have HF, is gonna be the Chameleon MCOM3. And for this, there's, again, multiple reasons. This is really configurable in lots of different ways. I can hoist this up high by using the uh, metal, metal connectors, the carabiners here, or I can string it down low and make it horizontal and do NVIS with this. So I get a lot of versatility out of this. This would be my second HF antenna that I would be packing in this kit. This one lives inside the box because, again, thinking EMP, I don't know if the, the match here the box could be affected by an EMP if it was left outside. So it's going in the can. The way to think about this is if it's something electronic or something you think might get damaged from an EMP, it needs to go in the can. And again, it's gonna be things that are gonna be vital, you think, after a disaster. So these are my thoughts. This is going in the can. Now I'm gonna give you a choose your own adventure solution um, here. I have, one item that can go in the can. I haven't decided yet. I'll actually let you guys decide or let me tell me what you think. I have other solar panels, but I thought it might be smart to have a second one, specifically this uh, Goal Zero, what is this, a seven watt charge, uh, charge panel or 10 watt. But part of the reason is because it's got this battery caddy and battery charging uh, device. This is the Goal Zero Guide 10 Plus the older unit they make newer models now but you can charge four double a batteries with this it takes a while but it will work with things like the tray for the ft3 dr the c crane skywave and the frs radio so it gives a lot of utility so this would support those radio systems without needing to charge off of my primary solar panel I'm in Southern California. It makes a lot of sense to have solar since we have so many days of sunlight. This makes sense, but you may want to replace this with this. This is my Alinko DR135. I think it's 60 watts or 65 watts. Two meter only VHF radio. Now I have the FT2 DR, right? And it's a perfect fit for this kind of kit. But maybe instead of the extra AA batteries, you might want more power on VHF specifically, or you want something devoted to VHF specifically that can interface with your Raspberry Pi for doing packet radio. I live in an area, Southern California, where we have a ton of packet radio and packet radio enthusiasts. While I would assume that the repeaters will go down if there's an EMP, I don't believe that we will go completely without packet radio though after the emergency. I'm sure somebody might be able to get something up and running. Packet radio, as I've talked about on other live streams, is extremely valuable in an emergency situation because you're basically taking this radio, hopscotching through other radios to make very long connections for exchanging data, in this case messages, through like something like a personal bulletin board system which is a major throwback to the 90s, early 90s, as far as what the internet looked like even before that. But it would allow you to exchange information very easily and you'd quickly be able to set up an interconnected network of these packet radio devices. So should this go in or the solar panel? It really depends on what you think your needs are gonna be. I'll let you decide. I think what I'm gonna op probably opt to do is just pull out the double A battery charger and keep that with the VHF UHF radio in the can. The trouble is making it all fit. 
So powering this whole box, or at least some of it, is going to be a BioNO 9 amp hour battery. You can add more batteries to this. This one BioNO sent to me to check out. I've been using BioNO for a really long time, and they're pretty much the only batteries I use when I go out and I need an external battery for doing soda or, or parks on the air. So that's definitely a good solution. That's the why I went with that. Now, 9 amp hours, you're going to have to give it enough power. And that's part of the problem with a, with a box like this is you don't have a lot of space. If you had a larger Faraday cage or something like that that you could put another panel in, or you're just not that worried about a panel being damaged. To be honest, I don't know uh, how damaged a panel could be during an EMP, but I'm assuming the worst case scenario again, worst case. So that's why I went with also the BioNO uh, 25 watt panel, again, because it fits in the, in the box. This is gonna be about as much as I can put in without going to like a roll-up unit, but those generally are pretty tall and this needs to fit within the case. So it, it can be affected by your other choices. So for charge controllers, you gotta have a charge controller for your solar panel. I went with two options. You decide which one will work for you. This is the BioNO 12 volt, 24 volt, 20 amp hour charge controller and the Buddy Pull Power Mini. They each have their different advantages and disadvantages. This is a little bit bigger. This is a more of a traditional charge controller where you put the raw leads in here with the screws. This is more of a portable job. You wouldn't necessarily want to like set this up at home necessarily, mount it to a wall like this one would be. This does allow you to connect power poles directly to it, which is nice and gives you a nice readout on the screen. Uh, this one does too, as far as what the draw is, and they both feature uh, USB ports for charging, which is also, again, a second level of capability. So if you had that first panel, the Goal Zero panel, you had USB charging, and with this, you also have USB charging. A little bit of redundancy. All right, now I gotta show you what radio, HF radio I'm bringing. I think you can guess. Yes, it's the G90. I gave one of these G90s away last year when it came out. Thanks, MFJ, for doing that, by the way. Uh, after I saw it at the Hamvention 2019 in Xenia. Well, I decided to get another one. <laughs> so uh, again, thanks for MFJ for sending this out. The more I'm thinking about this, the more I'm thinking about putting a, a, a kit aside away that could just kind of sit and, and be its thing, possibly get dragged out to do a POTA. A lot of POTA ups are just drive ups. This has a lot of compelling options that um, I think is, is why I went with it. It's inexpensive, right, obviously. So if you're interested in making one of these, you could buy one yourself, they're like $450. With what I've learned since the first time I reviewed it, which again, I reviewed it very highly, I found out that it's actually pretty easy programming this for doing digital modes, which was something I didn't really do at the time with this radio in a review. Since then, I've been having a blast doing digital modes on this, and I put on the base plate fan, or the tray, if you will, on this unit, specifically for doing digital mode. So I can run basically full 20 watt output um, with it out getting too hot. And it's been great. It's with the base plate on here. Sure, if you took it off, you could save some, some weight and some space in the can, but you get both the power connectors for power poles and then the stock connector it comes with. And then obviously you get the fan to prop it up and keep it cool when you're doing digital. There's another reason why I think All right, Kilo November 6, go full tell Mike, Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. Thank you for the contact. Have a good uh, rest of your weekend, 73. Now, some of you might be thinking, why did he go with the G90? Why didn't he go with an FT891? Why didn't he go with uh, some other portable? Why didn't he go with his KX2? Well, again, this is going to live in a can. <laughs> it's going to be there. And second, I wanted something that had less power draw than an FT891, but more power output than a KX2. So if I'm thinking about being able to run as long as possible on a not too large battery, uh, assuming that I get decent charge capability out of the solar panel, I want something that can live with this relatively well, then the G90 is a perfect choice because it doesn't take up that much power on receive. It takes up more obviously on, on transmit, but it's still much less than an FT891. Plus it's smaller. Even if you add the, the tray on the bottom, it's not as long or as wide. And the width is actually what causes the most amount of problems when you're trying to put something in a tall cylinder. Uh, that causes more problems than anything in trying to jam things in and fit them all together. So that's part of the reason why I went with the G90. Also, 
I don't think that you're gonna need much power if there is an EMP problem. Why? Well, I assume that I'm gonna be running NVIS most of the time. That's gonna be up and back down to communicate locally. And if that's the case, and we just go through an EMP where actual damage is done and grids are gonna be brought down, then the noise floor is gonna be minimal. I'll be able to hear everything. The noise is literally that static that sits right below what you're trying to hear or, or sometimes over it, it would drop that down to nothing. You're gonna be able to hear everything and they're gonna be able to hear you at even 20 watts. So low power output, lower footprint, really it's got the screen on it <laughs> so I can see what's going on. All of that are just compelling reasons to add the G90 to my EMP kit, if you will. And yeah, that waterfall is gonna be handy because I don't just have to scan around like crazy. I can scan around while also looking at the screen and getting a really good idea of who's out there and seeing them on the waterfall. Those are all very compelling reasons for me, but what would you put in your kit? Post below. Now I didn't show this in the beginning, but this is the accessory bag for the G90. This, com this contains the CE19 and it's uh, speaker mic and all that good stuff, as well as an extra power lead and, and, extra fuses for that power lead. Do I assume that necessarily the EMP is gonna take out a fuse? Probably not, but uh, why not keep them just in the kit? They don't take out that much space so that you could just grab this and go. All right, my admin bag is the last thing I'll, I'll talk to you about. And this is normally where the FT2DR goes and lots of other things. I have a Lucy Lantern in here. Is it still called Lucy? Yeah, it's still called Lucy. Lucy Solar Lantern, this is a small one solar powered charging so that's a no-brainer got a couple other odds and ends there's some tools like this uh, SOG switch multi-tool not my favorite multi-tool but it's going to live forever in this bag I can always upgrade this stuff as I get better gear or swap gear out as I need to so have that in mind you're, you're trying to set a baseline of capability and if you start to upgrade over time that would be great Add the cables for different chargers, little nylon bag for different assorted coax adapters for all the antennas that I would be packing with me. And uh, these just get little zipped up bags. They got a clip on the side. This is nice, this is a county cob job. So the last thing before I, I show you the remaining antenna and show you how I built this bin is my computer. This also has been on Instagram. This is a GPD pocket two. This is, <laughs> this is the whole laptop. This is the smallest laptop that I think you can get that is still functional. This is a full Windows 10 laptop, faster than a Surface Go uh, laptop. And the advantage of this over those devices, two USB 3.0 ports, a USB-C port, and a micro SD card. I have Wikipedia loaded on here. I have multiple documents loaded on here, important documents, all the manuals for all the gear in here. I also have the image for my Raspberry Pi along with Belena Etcher or Belina Etcher for re-imaging it if I have to do that on the fly. The battery life is about five hours and one of the best parts, which is why it's in this kit, it charges off of a USB-C connector and will work off of five volts of power, yes. So you can add whatever it is to your kit, make sure your charge controller can actually put out the five volts and about three amps that this requires, or get yourself a battery backup, like a USB bank or something like that. And you can run the charge off of that battery bank and then top it off with the solar. Realistically, while you're going through your new future disaster world after an EMP, you will have to source new, better equipment, like better solar panels, maybe better batteries, but at least you have a baseline here that you can start working with because eventually, you know, it's going to take a long time to charge things up like this and battery banks and keep your radio going, so on and so on. So keep that in mind. You do need to spec your kit appropriately, but at the end of the day, there's only so much you can fit in here. And if everything were to die around you, what would you put in here and how much capability would you, would you bake into that? Something I forgot to mention about the GPD Pocket 2. The GPD Pocket 2 being Windows 10 means it's compatible with all the ham radio software. So if you are in a situation, again, where you're gonna be running digital modes and there are signals out there that you can receive, you can run things like JSA Call. I don't know why you'd run FT8 after an EMP, but it runs it. 
for doing POTA, for instance. Uh, it will also run FL Digi, FL Rig. It will run WinLink email system, which I actually have been using that through that device with my G90. It's working very well, so it's been a lot of fun to build this out. Let me show you my last antenna that I will be packing, packing in and around this kit, uh, and then we'll talk about how I built the, t the, the tin can, the tactical trash can. All right, so my last antenna is the MFJ1664 manual screwdriver antenna. I will go all the way down to 80 meters with the stock whip that it comes with. It does have a lug here on the side for radials. That's what matched the radials that you saw earlier in the video. And I have, uh, I've had very little problems with this. You may be asking, why not just take the Wolf River coil? You could, yeah, it would be fine, um, fine option. In fact, the Wolf River coil has the same mount on the bottom here. So it would just go on top of the lid and that would work just fine. For me though, this was a, a nice little option mounted to the stock whip and the sleeve fully closed you get about 20 meters out of it so you would have to adjust this shorter if you wanted to get some of the higher bands but uh so far it integrates perfectly onto my tactical lid from my tack can here and works fine it's an inexpensive option it's not very expensive i found that the tuning is probably the the best part about this it's extremely quick to just loosen the nut here bolt i don't know what they call that it's not a wing nut but anyway, it doesn't matter. And just slide it up and down. You pop the G90 into tune mode, SWR reader mode. And then you just go up here, turn it, close it, step back, put your hands up, look at the thing. It's in it, not in adjusted. Then you just adjust it really quickly like that. Check it. That's all it takes. It's very easy. All right. So what did I do in my tack can to make it a, a viable option? Well, the first thing I did is I sprayed the interior with contact cement, and then I used pieces of cardboard up against the edges and went all the way around and then shoved something down in the bottom. On the top of that, I used a, a bit of a thin packing material to coat the inside, and then I trimmed the edges. That's really all I had to do. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. When you put the lid on top of this and you're sealing it off, you're creating a seal for your tactical trash can Faraday cage, you're keeping in mind that, you know, things like this, right, this little lip here, all around it, and there's another lip right there, could introduce this EMP wave radiation into your tactical trash can. So you do need to consider the sealing of your lid before you, you close this up and consider that you're good. It might not be the best it could be, particularly if you had a really high-powered EMP that affected electronics more nearby than you. This is the uh, seal that we're talking about. It's an electrical seal, mesh of, of kind of a metal mesh. And the center is a, a foam, a bit of foam. So we need to get this onto the lid. I don't know a better way of doing it other than just start working my way around, kind of in the corner, because this wants to be straight. So I'm gonna, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to start like this. So what is the pace plan for all this crazy stuff that I've got on my workbench? Well, the primary is probably going to be, again, it depends on your goals, right? As we learned in the, the last live stream, your pace goals are going to match what it is you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve information gathering and understanding what's going on, then your primary may be just this simple AM, FM, shortwave, weather, aeronautical. What else does this do? That's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, radio. It's a receiver. It runs off of two AA batteries. It's easy to keep up and running and it works really well. So that could be your primary. Your alternate would likely be something like a VHF UHF radio that you're gonna carry around with you, listen to. This is also wide banded and you'd be listening for APRS as well. Hopefully you pick up APRS signals, that'd be great. Those are people you can actually talk to. That'd be your alternate. Now your contingency could be the Alinco 135 to get more power on simplex to talk to local stations on VHF. 
You may not want to necessarily put out high power immediately after some kind of emergency. Um, don't know. This could be your contingency plan where all the chips are down and you absolutely have to call out to somebody you know that you've made plans with or to somebody you heard that needs help or you yourself if you need help. This could be your contingency. And lastly, good old emergency <laughs> here at FRS Radio. Maybe not, but the idea remains the same. This is nice to have. You'd be scanning on this and you'd have the capability to talk if you heard a local signal with it. All right, so let's flip it and reverse it a bit. What if I absolutely wanted to get a message out to somebody and we had an agreed to comms plan? I had a buddy of mine who set up a TAC can just like I do, or maybe you set up a TAC can just like I do. What would be our primary mode of communication? Probably HF radio without a question. We'd probably go here first because there'd be a bunch of you out there and we'd want to establish communication. We'd likely use something like JSA call would be a wonderful option for that so that we could connect on here. We could send messages back and forth and be able to connect that way. My alternate for that would be my two meter packet radio solution using the Raspberry Pi as the TNC basically and the brains that would encode and decode the, the signals for two meter packet. With two meter packet, we're not gonna get the greatest range you could get with HF, but we'd still get out there and we would be able to hop through nodes and be able to establish communication that way. Effective communication, really useful communication because it would be over VHF. And if we could establish a long line node connection, we'd be able to transmit information back and forth very easily. Now the contingency in this case is a lot to desire, right? There's, there's only so much you're gonna get out of this. Um, the contingency in this case would likely be APRS. Now APRS, this is a second radio that does APRS. You can do APRS with your two meter uh, packet radio, by the way, using different software that runs on the Raspberry Pi, and, and that would work for this too. In fact, probably works better on this way, but remember, you got to have redundant systems in pace. So this contingency option is an HT running APRS. In fact, they could work in tandem. You could work packet with this and APRS with this. And back to FRS for your, your emergency communication. This is gonna be local comms, right? You're just gonna be able to talk locally. I'm sure you probably have better options that again, you can post in the comments and, and you're gonna have a different view than I will have as well. I wanna give a big shout out to the Canadian Prepper Podcast. They did an episode on your uh, bucket bug out kit or your, your bucket survival kit or emergency disaster kit. I was listening to the episode and I'm like, oh man, that'd be fun to do with radio. Why would I carry my radios around in a bucket? And then I went, aha, a steel bucket, aluminum, stainless steel, whatever, that would be EMP resistant or EMP proof. And that's a compelling option. A lot of go boxes, ham radio gear is not really considering EMP in uh, their preparations and, and maybe they shouldn't. I'll, I'll leave kind of the, the video on, on this point. Statistically, I don't have a lot of faith, faith that there will be an EMP disaster in the future. I don't, I don't think that's really something um, we have lined up for us. But I have been asked this question a lot in the comments, and that podcast gave me a perfect opportunity to explore this space. So thank you to the Canadian Prepper Podcast for, for kind of putting a little ember in my brain. And all the questions uh, that acted as fuel on that ember to create this roaring inferno of, of radio equipment that I have in front of me. I had a lot of fun making this and thinking about this. I've had a whole lot of fun deep diving personal self-reliance in the area of communications this last couple of months as we've, you know, we've had Mike on the show. There was time leading up to that where I was talking with Mike about what we could talk about. We obviously did the pace video a couple of weeks ago or last week. It's just been a lot of fun to kind of reinvigorate emergency preparedness with an angle on emergency comms specifically. I will post links to all of this mountain of stuff. Hopefully I've been tracking along and the, and the cards are over there or something like that. Those cards will take you to videos where I have reviewed all this stuff before and reviewed the different methods of communication that I have been speaking about. So JSA call, um, FL Digi, two meter packet. These are all things that have been topics of my shows. In fact, multiple topics of my shows. I will include them in the description as well so that you can find out more about these different modes of communication. I'm already way deep in the minutes in making this video and all the stuff that went into it. 
So I'm going to end this here, but please go explore these other content spaces, not just my videos, the other videos that are online as well, because these are all really valuable modes, not just for amateur radio, but for just having fun within the hobby. They're great, but these are also really good for emergency preparedness. JSA call is probably the unsung hero that's probably not getting uh, the... It really doesn't get the, the credit it deserves, I think, uh, largely, broadly. There are definitely pockets on YouTube that are absolutely uh, nutso over the application, and justifiably so. I want to hear your PACE plan for emergency communications after an EMP. Again, we're assuming the worst here. I want to hear it. I want you to post it in the descriptions. I want you to post on the Facebook group and the Discord. We've got an MCOM Discord chat room on our server. The link is in the description. I want you to make videos on this topic and, and add them to me, whether they're on Instagram, Twitter, or here on YouTube. Let me know. I want to check out your plan for a EMP resistant or EMP proof tactical trash can, or maybe you've got a better container you can put all your stuff in. I want to see it. Anyway, my name is Josh, KI6NAZ. You've been watching the Ham Radio Crash Course. Thank you so much for doing so. If you haven't, please give me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I do live stream every Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, I'll talk to you later. See ya.